tonight I'm going to take you through some of the favourite astronomy pictures that um, I've ever taken myself and a little bit of kind of the story behind these pictures as well um, because some of them are not necessarily the most technically brilliant of all the pictures but I, they've just got a story behind them and there's something that I've really enjoyed looking at and something that I've enjoyed actually capturing. Okay, so yeah I'm going to go through um, some of my favourite astronomy pictures that I've taken myself mostly from the UK. Some of them were actually taken from elsewhere and I'll tell you about those when we do them. So for anyone who doesn't know who I am um, my name is Mary McIntyre. I live in Oxfordshire but I'm from Lancashire originally and my my husband and I are both amateur astronomers and when we moved to Oxfordshire it was because of the, the village we live in had really dark skies and the intention was always to build an astronomy shed and that is what this is. I'm going to get my laser pointer up now. So this is our roll off roof shed. Now this shed was actually in a pile in pieces when we moved here so we decided to just kind of rework that as the main basis and then my husband built the roll off roof. Now, my husband and I both do astrophotography and any of you that do photography will know that there's multiple ways of capturing data. There's multiple ways of processing data and there's multiple ways of actually aligning the camera, etc. And my husband and I literally cannot agree on how the correct way should be to do that. So he built me my own peer so that it would shut me up and stop me nagging at him for doing it wrong all the time. Um, but this is a slightly less techie solution, which suits me better because I don't like it when things get overly technical. And I'm going to show you some pictures inside the shed in a minute, but underneath this bin to keep it water to tight is an EQ5 mount. It's got a sync scan handset and it, that's it. It's got mains power and it's that simple. So you can do go to with it and it's always polar aligned and it's very quick to set up and I quite like that. But inside the observatory shed um, it's even more complex now. We tend to run an Altair um, Hypercam on this um, Ritchie Crescent telescope. This beast of a mount is an EQ6 which is a lot more heavy duty than the EQ5 but it's all run from a planetarium software now and all the image capture everything is all done through a computer and actually most of the time once the roof's open we do that from inside the house. We also have these, um, we've got a couple of refractors and a solar telescope, which I tend to use on my pier, as we call it. And we also have this 10 inch Dobsonian telescope in its own little shed, which looks like a portaloo when the door is closed. But um, we've put it on the base of my old mobility scooter to make it a bit easier to maneuver around because the Dob you really can't use inside the shed unless you was to put it on tube rings on top of the mount. And um, because they pivot so low down, it's just not a sort of telescope set up that works in the shed so we tend to drag that out into the middle of the lawn and it's actually one of my favorite telescopes but we hardly ever use it because it's such a nuisance to kind of lug around so that's the inside of the observatory shed as well as that we, we these are three of our meteor cameras we now have a fourth one and possibly a fifth one in the pipeline these cameras are constantly videoing the sky um, during the hours of darkness looking for meteors and fireballs and because we're part of the UK meteor network if multi stations catch the same event you can triangulate and do a lot of science with the data from these cameras so they're running all the time and more recently we've added a kind of all sky camera that my husband built using bare bones components and um, built it for a fraction of the cost of buying one so um, that's also running and one of the meteor cameras and the all sky camera automatically create a time lapse and upload themselves to YouTube every morning so when, every morning when I'm having coffee I watch the the two time lapses to see if anything exciting's happened. As well as the photography, I actually love astronomy sketching, and these are just some of my sketches. And I think it's really important that sketching has helped me learn more about the moon than photography ever did. And, and I've loved astronomy since I was a kid, but I didn't have extensive knowledge of a lot of stuff. And I learn a lot with photography, but certainly with the sketching, I've learned a lot more and it makes me observe. Whereas with the picture, you sometimes I was getting guilty of taking a photograph, closing the observatory roof and going back inside again. So sketching has really made me kind of connect with the objects again. 
and I use astronomy to inspire my artwork as well. I love um. arts and crafts and these um, paintings are just an acrylic fluid pouring technique. They're not of anything in particular. They're just a generic nebula design stuff. So I kind of do that as well. And when I'm not doing astronomy and art, I play bass guitar. I'm not currently in a band as such. We're just my, my guitarist and I had our first practice today out in his garden for the first time in four months. So I do a little bit of singing, but I prefer prefer just playing bass and hiding at the back where no one takes any notice so just admit another one there so that's what I kind of do the rest of the time so I've broken down these pictures by category because I just really didn't know how else to do it because it was very difficult to even pick my favorites it's like kind of picking your favorite children in a way and I've broken it down into different categories so you just kind of go through and follow a, a kind of Oh, sorry, another admission. So I'm going to start with the sun and the moon. Now, the moon was actually the first thing I ever took a photograph of. This is not the first picture of the moon I ever took, I hasten to add. Um, the first moon picture I ever took was with my Helios um, four-inch refractor and a Canon PowerShot compact camera with two elastic bands holding it against the eyepiece. And I did my GCSE astronomy coursework with those pictures, and it was the first time I'd ever been able to take a photograph that showed different lunar features. And compared to what I'm doing now, those pictures are quite grim but the first picture I ever took of the moon on a telescope with my first ever digital SLR is still on my Flickr stream because I think it's important to just remember your own progression. Now this moon diagram, the moon phase diagram are all my own pictures and this was one of my best pictures that I've ever taken with our 8 inch Ritchie Crescent telescope. It's only a stack of 120 images which in stacking terms is not that many but it really gives you such a beautiful beautiful picture. You need to use a focal reducer with that scope because the moon doesn't quite fit. But this was with a Canon 1100D or I have three Canon 1100Ds and I have an ASI 120 camera. The majority of the pictures tonight were taken with the 1100D which is a, a very entry level camera but I do quite well with it. So that, that was um, one of my favourite kind of large moon pictures. Now because I find it quite difficult to manoeuvre the big telescopes around um, I tend to use the refractor quite a lot. The William Optics one is the best one we have. It's only a 70 mil refractor and with the ASI camera I made a four pane mosaic of um, the first quarter moon when the lunar x and the v were visible um, last year and I really love this phase of the moon because there's so much interesting stuff going on with the crater shadows etc and what's amazing if you want to zoom in on this area even with a small refractor you can just put a barlow in there and I used a 5x barlow on this particular occasion and it, you get in super close to the x and it just shows you the kind of field of view that you can get Sorry, I can hear somebody's microphone on again. Can everyone just make sure they're muted, please? Thank you. Um, so yeah, even if you've got a small refractor, if you invest in a good quality Barlow and the seeing is good, you can get in really deep into those craters and look at the features and crater shadows and these things like the Lunar X, they're called Claire Obscure effects and they're only visible for a small amount of time each month. And then that doesn't necessarily coincide with the moon being above the horizon in the UK. So the, the Lunar X, for example, has only got two apparitions at night time, the entire of 2020 it's visible in the daytime some of the time but you know the fact that you can get in that deep even with a small refractor I think is pretty cool if we look at the V up close um, these are all just the way that light is kind of reflecting off the rims of craters and it causes these interesting effects and even after about four or five hours the X disappears because the shadow terminator has moved and kind of wiped it out but just the amount of detail that you can pick up with these I mean these are stacked images but they're not huge amounts of stacking but also looking up here at these mountain shadows I absolutely love harsh shadows on the moon it's one of the things that I love observing I love sketching them and just by looking at the length of the shadows here we can infer something about the height of the features that have created them and it was actually pictures like this when astrophotography was in its infancy that led to some of the these crazy lunar landscape art 
paintings that the space artists were creating back in the day. We do now, of course, know that the angle of the sun is what creates the shadows being super long, the same way that it does with us on Earth. When the sun's lower, our shadow is longer. So the, mo the mountains on the moon are not actually as tall as some of the old space art would suggest. But looking at mountain shadows like this is just so beautiful. And it's just something I never get bored of. And again, this is Ptolemaeus trio, one of my favorite crater trios on the moon. And you can really see these interesting effects. Actually, last month I got this when the Claire Obscure effect called the face, um, just it's like a silhouette of a face in there. I got that um, last time as well. Actually, that isn't the Ptolemaeus trio. Sorry. No, it's the Al Albategnus. The Ptolemaeus trio is right next to it. There are two crater trios that are visible like a day apart. But yeah, the crater shadows at this phase are absolutely gorgeous, whether it's the first quarter or a last quarter. It's definitely my favorite time to observe the moon. When there's a crescent moon, taking a longer exposure picture will bring up the earth shine. And oh, earth shine is so beautiful. You can see it naked eye sometimes when the conditions are right and with binoculars you can easily see it and that is just where the amount of light bouncing back off the earth from the sun is actually just illuminating the side of the moon that isn't illuminated by the sun. So both of these are waxing crescent moon um, pictures. One was taken from France, this one was done at Astro Farm and this one was taken in 2018 and whenever there's a star or a planet nearby as well it makes for a really pretty moon and I love a waning crescent moon as well but everyone who knows me knows I don't often do dawn and that's usually when that moon is visible. So the waxing crescent moon is a, a little bit more of a sensible time for you to observe it. I, for years, had been trying to get an aircraft transit in the moon, and it would be one of those situations where whenever I was tweaking the focus on the telescope, a plane would shoot across and I just wouldn't get it. And that happened so many times that it would almost reduce me to tears of frustration. So um, I was out just photographing the crescent moon because it was in conjunction with some other planets, and I just noticed this aircraft approaching. And because it was near sunset, the vapor trails were bright orange, so I was really happy it wasn't done with a telescope it was just my 1100d with a 300 mil zoom lens but I was really really pleased with that picture then in January this year um, the rising of the full moon it was the wolf moon um, based on the Native American um, farming almanac every full moon of the month is named the January moon is the wolf moon and this helicopter transited I didn't even know it was a helicopter I saw an aircraft approaching quickly changed the settings because I knew that the exposure I had would be too long to get anything um, without smearing if it was transiting took the pictures and when I reviewed it I realized that it was actually a helicopter and I love this picture I call it Airwolf Moon because I remember as a child being very excited on a Saturday night watching Airwolf on the telly this is not a particularly well focused picture of the moon it's not the best picture of a helicopter but I absolutely love this picture and I love the fact that the exhaust of the helicopter is disrupting the limb of the moon there as well so yes it's not the best quality picture it's not a stacked image it's you know there's a lot of faults with this and it's an aggressive crop as well with a 300 mil lens I still absolutely love this picture and it's actually going to be in a book next year as well it's only the second time that's happened to me um, I actually got three photographs I was shooting in raw at the time so the right to card speed was very slow so these were the three pictures that I got of the helicopter as it crossed the moon so I just stacked them together and made my own version of an apocalypse now kind of vibe but um yeah I thought that was really good fun and then in May this year I was just having one of those days when I was out with my camera and saw this 747 heading straight towards the moon so I kind of having never got an aircraft transit in the last couple of years I've managed to get three that I'm really happy with this was a cargo lux flight that was on its way to Luxembourg I believe transatlantic flight so yeah I was really pleased with that and again not the best focus not the best anything but it was just one of those pictures that I was super super happy with and it was one that was crying out for me to have a go with Pixeloop if any of you aren't aware Pixeloop is an app that you can download for your phone and you can animate pictures with it I, I just thought this was screaming to have the vapor trails kind of animated I know that Pixeloop is a bit of a love-hate thing but I just thought that was a bit of fun with this particular picture 
Um, while we're still on the sun and the moon, I do. Um, I haven't done very much recently because the sun has just been so quiet. There hasn't really been much to photograph, but we have a hydrogen alpha solar telescope and we have white light filters for all of the other telescopes that we have. Um, so I do a lot of sunspot observation and these sunspots were kind of the biggest that I've ever recorded. This particular one eluded me for almost the entire time that it was visible on the sun's surface because of sunspots tend to stay in the same location but the sun is rotating really quickly so if you get a decent sunspot group you just kind of have to image them because 10 days later it's going to be kind of moving towards the limb and this was by far the biggest sunspot group I've ever imaged and this was in 2014 again when there was a lot more solar activity and this was uh, another fairly substantial sized sunspot um, group. Both of these are stacked images. The, this picture here was an 1100D one with the William Optics refractor. This one also the William Optics refractor but with the ASI 120 camera which I just love. It's such a great camera. And if you put this into some context this is what Jupiter and the Earth have looked like to scale. So this sunspot group here was about the size of Jupiter and we all know that Jupiter is huge compared to the Earth so these really were significantly huge sunspot groups. So they're amongst my favorites. Now I mentioned the hydrogen alpha solar telescope and one of the things that is the most pleasing about that telescope is being able to photograph prominences and um, if you don't know prominences are basically superheated plasma that is being ejected from the sun's surface and when we view that from the edge like end on we see it as these prominences and they're not flames although they do look like flames they're just superheated gas that has been suspended on magnetic field lines if you was to look at this particular feature from above it would look something like this these are called filaments but they're actually exactly the same they're just viewed from a different angle and you can see there are some smaller prominences around the edge here but this particular one here this hedro prominence was absolutely huge and there's a 2x barlow in the train here because you need one of those to focus the 11 100D with that. It was a 190 image stack. The conditions were pretty poor that day and this telescope doesn't really respond that well to photography with the digital SLR. But what really brings this to scale, if you put the solar ruler onto here, you can see that this first line here is 50,000 kilometers. This one is 100,000 kilometers. So that feature was 100,000 kilometers tall. So that is just the Earth to scale there. That just shows you how big that was and Jupiter to scale again. So the height of this prominence was almost the diameter of Jupiter. So that's by far the biggest prominence that I've ever imaged. I've had some that are pretty tall, kind of around the 50,000 mark. But yeah, that was a really, really tall prominence. And I think it'll be a while before I see one that big again. So yeah, not the best picture of the sun I've ever taken. But because of that feature, it's definitely amongst my favourites. Something else in terms of transits that I'd wanted to do for years was the International Space Station crossing either the sun or the moon. I wasn't fussy, I just wanted one of them. And once I had access to the ASI camera and that made that more likely because the Canon 1100D's video function is not great. It doesn't give you a lot of functionality. It just doesn't have the frame rate that's needed to pull this off. Um, so in June last year, I actually managed to do this and I actually did a, a vlog of this on my YouTube channel and uh, I was slightly excited if you go back and watch that video. Um, so this is just with a 2X Barlow, but you can like zoom in on that. You can clearly see some of the structure of the space station. And this was the first time I'd ever done this. There was no sunspots to see, so it was very difficult to know if the focus was correct, but I was so excited that I'd finally got it. And then in January 2020, I actually had a space station transit of the moon. What I find fascinating here is the space station was illuminated at the time, but as it approaches the, the moon here, you can see that it's white and it's actually white over here as well on the moon surface. But just for these little bits here, it ends up looking like it's in silhouette. So it's a tricky thing to process because I ended up using layer masks because what made this one look good made this one look terrible, etc. So there was quite a lot of um, fiddling went on with this picture but again so excited to finally have a, a lunar transit of the ISS and I actually did it again in May and this time the scene was really bad and I should have known better but I just thought I'm going to push it and try and get more detail and use a 3x Barlow this time I really wish I hadn't because the scene conditions were so terrible that day that it, it just didn't turn out that well but 
you know, you can still tell that it's a space station. And a year ago, I'd have been super excited with this. You just start to get a bit strict with yourself when you feel you've done a better job previously. But there will be plenty more to come from. And if any of you want to have a go at this, there's a website called Transit Finder. I think transitfinder.com. And you just it knows where you are. It's a bit of a stalker, but it kind of knows your location and will tell you what transits are due to come up. And I think CalSky also have an email alert system for transits of not just the space station, but larger satellites and some of the bigger ones you can capture as well. So this is something else I will definitely do more of um, once I've kind of had a bit more practice. Hopefully I can do a better job. Uh, on the subject of the sun, we had the holiday of a lifetime in 2017 for our, um, we got married in 2016, but we decided to go to the USA to see the solar eclipse um, for our honeymoon. So we went there and we basically took four digital SLRs. We had three bridge cameras and four mobile phone cameras capturing this entire event. And these pictures around totality and we had four cameras, but only three tripods. I took at my little tabletop tripod and the idea was that I was going to stick that on the roof of the hire car so during totality I could take pictures with it kind of held sturdy. They upgraded our hire car and that meant I wasn't tall enough to reach the height of the roof of the hire car because I'm only five foot three so I had to do this handheld and everybody warned me that I would get super emotional during the eclipse and I was quite dismissive of that and thinking oh it's just alignments it's not that exciting really it's exciting but not something that was going to make me cry but the reality was when totality hit I was bawling my eyes out I blame sleep deprivation because it was a very tiring holiday but just amazing so I was shaking I was crying and I had to do all of this handheld the fact that I even got the sun in shot is quite frankly miraculous so I look at these pictures and yes there are things I'd like to do better if I get the opportunity to see another eclipse but I still can't quite believe that this is my picture when I look at it and this was done with the wide field camera the entire event all stacked in one this bit around totality I took 2,000 photographs and this is just three of them that show the two diamond rings and the totality ring so that was a really extra special moment for us and one that I will never ever forget I think it's your first solar eclipse you never forget it and that's that picture up close I really wish I, I manually bracketed the shot so that meant that I was taking longer exposure times over and over just going up and up and up because to try and preserve detail here takes a short exposure but this corona extends about 30 solar radii out from the sun so in order to capture anything out at this sort of distance you need to do a lot longer in exposure now obviously being handheld there was a limit to what I could do in terms of going out this way but I really wish I'd been able to do a longer exposure to bring out earth shine on the moon here because earth shine as you saw in one of those pictures earlier it's just flashback from light on the surface of the earth so if I'd done a longer exposure I would have had a little bit more in the way of surface features visible on the moon side um, but you know for a first go I'm very happy with that and it was a really amazing amazing holiday highly recommend that you go and see one if you haven't already seen a solar eclipse and I quite often get asked about astrophotography and what sort of telescopes should people buy and I always tell them that probably two thirds, if not more of all the photography I do is without a telescope at all. So I've put um, these favorite pictures together for what I've kind of classified as night wide field nightscapes. And um, that includes anything that was taken without a telescope essentially. Now the Milky Way, this has taken me so long to be able to get a picture that I'm really happy with, um, but I kind of got there finally. These, this arch of the Milky Way was actually taken from Oxfordshire. Um, this is my house. I was in the field behind my house. I did another one of these um, last month actually and managed to get the village in shot as well because this was done with a kit lens. I now have invested in a wide angle lens. This was a 22 pane mosaic, two rows of 11, one going along the bottom, one going along the top and we have a lot of light pollution near Oxford City to the south of us there there's a lot of LED light pollution from villages over this way so the fact that I was even able to get this at all from Oxfordshire was actually quite amazing to me and yeah Milky Way photography is something I still feel like I'm learning a lot and it's been the longest journey for me to actually get anything that I'm remotely happy with but yeah these arched 
Milky Way shots it's just kind of one of those things that was on my bucket list and I never really quite managed to nail it until somebody told me that doing it earlier in the year is better because once the Milky Way is going directly overhead the distortion of the sky around the zenith makes it very difficult for the software to stitch so yeah just basically my 1100d kit lens twin single shots all 20 seconds just all stitched together and then processed in Lightroom so yeah Milky Way photography is awesome I've also done the Milky I've done a lot of Milky Way photography and quite often it really shows up the limitations of the 1100d in terms of noise in low light level particularly in the summer when it's very warm the noise level of that camera is horrendous if you have a more modern digital SLR, you can push the ISOs higher without getting quite so much graininess. But this was taken in Lyme Regis in 2018. We had a two week holiday there and there's one clear night where there was no moon interfering. We had a one hour window before the moon rose and started to bleach the sky again. Um, with all the summer that year Mars was right next to the Milky Way and you can see this lovely red reflection of Mars on the sea, which was just absolutely gorgeous. <clears throat> excuse me sorry I'm still recovering from a cough that I've had for 16 weeks um, so yeah Mars was reflected in the sea if only this bank of cloud hadn't been there this would have been an extraordinary shot but you know having the Milky Way coming up out of the sea with no light pollution between me and it because I was on the south coast in Lyme Regis the best I've ever seen the Milky Way visually better than I ever thought I would see it in the UK this picture on the right was one I just there was taking 90 second shots with our star adventurer and I'd actually done 31 shots because I did a time lapse video of the Milky Way while it was being tracked and it shows the movement of the earth kind of moving up to to meet the sky as the Milky Way was setting and I just stacked them to see what happens and yeah there's a lot of horrible cruddy stuff going up here but the amount of detail in this shot here so it's 31 images each 90 seconds so you'd think that in a way you would get even more detail but bearing in mind the amount of light pollution in this part of the sky I can't quite believe I got this picture to be honest and I didn't take those pictures with the intention of stacking but it just goes to show it's worth trying this stuff I do a lot of time lapses if the camera's been pointing exactly the same way doing a time lapse I always put my images through star stacks to get star trails if I've done a time lapse like this I will always stack the images just to see what I get out of it because you just never know so that's definitely the most detail I've ever caught on a Milky Way picture and um, yeah it's not the greatest because it's a lot of noise a lot of background kind of artifacts in it but still very clearly a lot of Milky Way information there <clears throat> now I mentioned star trails just now this wind turbine is about six miles away from our village it's just on the side of the main Banbury road between Oxford and Banbury and I love doing star trails with that windmill in the foreground I just think it makes for a really pretty foreground interest this particular night um if you kind of point over that way a little bit you've got the main road and my camera was pointing ever so slightly too near the oncoming traffic so pretty much every picture had lorry headlights in it and it was so bad that it just destroyed the star trails image but I just realized that the Milky Way was in the field of view here and I just processed it as if it was a Milky Way shot now this was a 30 second shot and in 30 seconds the stars in the southern part of the sky like this have definitely trailed in that time so if I was doing Milky Way photography in general I just would not ever do a 30 second shot on a static tripod but on this occasion I did process it as if I'd shot it for the Milky Way and yet if you zoom in on this you can definitely see the stars are not circular but I actually really love this picture it's one of my favorite Milky Way shots and um, when I sell photo cards this is one of the ones that always sells it's always very very popular so again just the kit lens with that camera 30 second shot at ISO 1600 now I mentioned earlier that at the beginning of the year I invested in a wide angle lens and this just shows you the difference in field of view this is from behind our house again 10 lots of 20 seconds with the 10 mil lens and you're getting a lot of milky way here and quite a lot of detail which um no i'm still finding ways of processing the milky way that's slightly better but i'm really excited to play with this lens over the summer and do more of it um so it would be great fun 
Um, when I mentioned earlier about the getting the arch shape of the Milky Way is easier in the spring when the Milky Way is a bit lower. In the height of summer, it tends to go north to south, almost directly overhead um, during the middle of the night, um, during the only hours of darkness we get. And this particular panorama was done in 2019 from St. Ives. This is St. Ives Coast Guard Station. This was another holiday where we had very few clear nights to actually do this, but it's quite dark there. And um, yeah, it's a bit cruddy again in the south of limitations of the 1100D, but because the sky is so dark, there's a lot of detail here for, again, all single shots, all just 20 seconds. I made the cardinal sin of doing this at ISO 3200. I know I shouldn't have done because ISO 3200 on this camera in low light level equals a lot of noise but um, <coughs> being somewhere so dark I just couldn't resist it. I mentioned that being somewhere dark and I've been to France to Astro Farm a few times and done lots of Milky Way photography there and was always under the impression that I would never get anything better from the UK but actually if the seeing conditions are good and there's no moon out of the way even from my kind of outskirts of Oxford city um, we say so we're probably 10 miles north of Oxford this was done with a fixed 50 mil lens that's a bit of a faster lens so I did this at f1.8 so much detail in the Milky Way shot here and these were just 10 second exposures so I like showing these side by side because it just shows how powerful that 50 mil lens actually is now obviously you've got to do twice as many pictures to get all of it in shot but this year one of the things I really want to do is actually repeat this but stacking each pane so that I take probably 20 or 30 shots if I'm going to do that I need to not have anything in the foreground because the Milky Way will have moved and then I'll have to kind of merge it together with one of the single shots but if you can pick up this much detail from a village where I am then you know it's it's quite reassuring to be honest you don't necessarily have to go somewhere super dark as long as you're outside of the main lights from the town you can actually pick this up and I find it interesting as well if I look at one of my early Milky Way panoramic pictures it looked nothing like this and the sky hasn't changed it's still the same location it's just a slightly better lens and just learning better processing techniques and it's really helped but yeah being able to get something like that with a 10 second shot I love that lens and it, same with getting enticed at going too high with your eye so if you get the f-stop too far down and have the iris too wide open that also can introduce graininess it can also overexpose the stars so you then lose the star color which is one of the most appealing things about astronomy pictures so actually <clears throat> if I repeat this I'm going to do it with a uh, probably f 2.5 rather than 1.8 just because I think it'll give me a better final result <coughs> now I mentioned star trails I, I love star trails photography and it's one of the easiest techniques in astrophotography if you know how to focus your camera you can do star trails and it's just dead simple to do and this is one of my favorite pictures this water tower was at upper hayford and all it was kind of in the area that's just been redeveloped it was an old air force base i believe and there was a big campaign to save this water tower but unfortunately they didn't succeed in saving it and it's now gone i went there several times with two cameras and i've done lots of different angles of star trails on this um this water this water tower and i just love it I really, really love it. And I can never decide between colour or monochrome with my Star Trails pictures. I always shoot in colour because I've got the option to desaturate it. Whereas if you shoot in black and white, you can't add the colour back in very easily. So I always make a version of both. I generally post both on Flickr because I'm completely undecided which one is my favourite. Another angle there is in a residential street. And I quite liked this picture. I know a lot of people like to clone out aircraft trails. The airspace above Oxford is so busy. I've just accepted that the higher level aircraft are just going to be there. And actually, it gives you a different layer of movement. But what I love about this picture, you've got the trailing stars. You've got my favorite water tower. There's the movement from this plane, and you've got some of the lines from planes as well. There's a really bright satellite that tracked through here that flared as well. I never was able to identify that satellite. But then on top of that, somebody drove home and off onto their drive so I ended up with car headlight trails as well so it's a busy image there's a lot going on but I quite like the different kind of movements that are within it and 
yeah, yeah, obviously I would normally have um, just omitted the headlight one from the stack because it's added this weird lens reflection. But I just love the picture with the um, car trails in. So car and star and satellite and aircraft trails all in one picture. I just find that quite pleasing. And again, couldn't decide between the colour and the monochrome. With colour, you can see the colour of the car headlights, which I quite like. But there's something kind of oldie worldy about it in monochrome. So yeah, I really like the grayscale one. Um, really impossible to decide. Um, I do also really love doing star trails pointing to the celestial pole. And this is looking directly at Polaris. And this is the longest star trails I've done to date, which was nine hours and 10 minutes. And I've got a bit of a project on the go now. I intend to put my camera in exactly the same position several times throughout the year and stack the images and then blend them all together so that I end up with full circles because obviously we don't have enough darkness to do a 24 hour full circle star trail in the UK. You need to be in the North or South Pole to be able to achieve that. So it's my plan to have a go at doing this and maybe filling in this entire circle somehow. I've tried it with a previous setup that I had and it didn't work very well but now I've got this new wide angle lens. I'm going to make sure that I align everything correctly and hopefully will manage to pull that off but that's a bit of a pet project that I've got ongoing this year but star trails are just so pleasing even to non-astronomers if you've got a favorite landmark like a water tower or a monument and you've got stars trailing in the background it just makes for such an interesting and very pleasing picture I couldn't possibly talk about wide field photography without showing this aurora picture and okay it's not the best aurora picture you'll ever see but this was taken from Oxfordshire and I have now photographed the aurora probably 13 12 or 13 times from Oxfordshire not at all in the last couple of years because aurora is linked to solar activity and the sun has been very quiet we're in the minimum period but to see this from Oxfordshire at all even during the height of solar activity is just extraordinary it was just such a special night and we only get about an hour and a half of darkness this was pretty much midsummer's night in 2015 um, I did 15 second exposures and the reason I did that is because previously when I've had Aurora from Oxfordshire there wasn't really any structure there were no pillars or anything like that it was basically just an auroral glow that you could see a green arch and maybe some color above that but there wasn't really much in the way of really obvious movement now if you have an aurora display that is very active the 15 second shot is too long which is why these pillars are quite smeared so obviously only ever photographing the aurora from the UK you don't tend to get a lot of practice at it and you certainly don't get a display like this very often so I you know I really wish I'd just done slightly shorter exposures but still the fact that I got that with my camera from a location just outside our village this is where I go for not to loosen cloud hunting great location and this is a time lapse of that night I, I just literally can't believe we saw this from Oxford and it didn't just show up on camera either. You could clearly see these pillars moving like way beyond the field of view of the camera. They were covering about 100 degrees of sky. It was probably a KP7 or 8 that night. So it was very, very active, but absolutely awesome. And I really hope that we get another display like that again once the solar activity builds up. That was quite something else. I actually, another time where I cried at an astronomical event, but I, I love astronomy. It gets me. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to some deep sky stuff now and these are the kinds of pictures that everybody always wants to aspire to I guess and it's another area I'm not an expert in any one of these fields of photography I always say to people if something is in the sky I like taking pictures of it whether it be a comet a bird of prey an aircraft some clouds so I photograph everything that's in the sky so um, but deep sky is definitely what secretly everybody wants to be able to do and one of the deep sky objects I really love are comets. Um, I actually co-host an Astronomy FM show called Comet Watch. Um, I don't know that much about comets actually, but I just find them so mesmerizing. No two ever look the same. And when you stack pictures centered on the comet, the stars will have moved in the background. 
and you can actually do a dual stack in Deep Sky Stacker so that you get rid of that. I actually really like the trailed stars in a comet image because it gives you a sense of how much that comet has moved against the background sky. And quite a lot of times comets, you can almost see them moving in real time. Some of them, they're moving so quickly. So this was just 77 shots at 90 seconds each with the 1100D, just ISO 1600. These little gaps here are where um, I've emitted some frames where cloud came through or whatever. In Deep Sky Stacker, you can order them by quality and um, that's what's happened there. It's emitted the ones that I told it were too rubbish to include. So that's why there's a bit of a gap in the trails. But yeah, just absolutely amazing to ob observe comets and they're a great thing to photograph. This is my favourite comet ever. This was Comet 2014Q2 Lovejoy. And oh my goodness, this was the comet that kept sparking the domestic disputes over whose turn it was to use the observatory shed. Because generally a deep sky object is going to be there every night for the season. So you can take it in turns if necessary. But comets come and then they're gone again. And you don't really get that many chances um, if the weather is not on your side. So I really love this comet. Its tail was changing constantly. Constantly, every day it looked different it was just so beautiful and when you invert these images you can often see way more detail in the dust tail than you can see on the normal picture this was the night after and you can see the tail looks completely different on this set of pictures and even though they were just a night apart as one's the 15th one was the 16th of January so just such an awesome comet absolutely beautiful I know in there I love reading stuff um, from history where everyone thought comets were harbingers of doom it was always seen as a bad omen for something but I just love them they're, they're really really cool the Orion Nebula is everybody's favourite. It's one of those objects I image every single year without fail. Even though there are many other objects I could image, I still tend to go back to it and image it every year. And this was the only time I've ever imaged the Orion Nebula using our 8-inch Ritchie Crescion telescope. And it only just fits into the field of view with that scope because it is a big object and actually you can't get any of the surrounding nebula regions or the other stars within our own sword with this one but what I did here is just 36 lots of 30 seconds for all of the outside parts and then just eight lots of 10 seconds for the core region this little region in the middle here of the Orion Nebula is so much brighter than every bit around the outside so it very quickly overexposes so I always do some shorter exposures and blend them in together then use in Star Spikes Pro. Uh, they, again, Star Spikes are a love hate thing. It's such a Marmite thing. When you take a picture with a refractor, there are no Star Spikes. And I know it's very much frowned upon sticking Star Spikes on a refractor image. But what you get with the Ritchie Crescent are these really fat, stumpy spikes, which I think are really ugly. And so I always enhance them with Star Spikes Pro. So it makes them look a little bit more elongated. And also that app actually. Um, increases the color saturation on stars as well so I actually quite like using it in a subtle way I don't like to make it too garish with these extremely bright ring flares or anything but I actually think it can look very artistic just having some star trails on a deep sky picture I know it splits the crowd this um, was the Orion Nebula again. It's the whole of the sword, actually. This is all of Orion's sword here. So we've got the Running Man Nebula up here. Sorry, my, my cat wants my attention. Um, so yeah, this was 30 lots of 120 seconds for the outside bits and then 80 lots of 15 seconds for the, um, the bit in the core there. And I didn't put star spikes on this. People would be pleased to see, but um, it's just one of those things that you just have to come back to again and again because it's just such a lovely object and it's just very very beautiful and just an old friend coming back to visit whenever Orion reappears in the skies um, and the other thing I kept doing wrong before I'd done this particular picture is I think a mistake that I have certainly been guilty of myself is trying to make the sky too dark when you process images this entire area around Orion is full of nebulosity. So in the past, I've always processed it so only this bit here was visible, but actually there are wisps of gas and dust way beyond that as well. So I now try to be a little bit more sympathetic to the fainter nebula regions as well. I've imaged this area on multiple occasions with the same setup. I still haven't brought all of those images together and stacked them to see what I get, but it's on my list of things to do um, when I find time. But 
yeah, you can't go wrong with the Orion Nebula. It's a really good one to learn. Um, the Pleiades is my favorite object. I, I just love it. I love looking at it through binoculars. I love pictures of it. I, I just think it's so beautiful. And we took this picture when we we're on our mini honeymoon. After we got married, we actually went to Astro Farm in France for a mini honeymoon for a long weekend. And while we were there, over every night that we were there, we imaged the Pleiades. So this was actually 33 different 300 second exposure so it was an extremely long exposure time in total and it was done with an 80 mil refractor so it was a bigger version of the William Optics refractor we've got it wasn't a William Optics I can't remember what sort it was but it was the same kind of apochromatic refractor so I always thought that because the astro farm sky's been so dark and the fact this was a better telescope than we've got it was auto guided and I never do auto guiding on my telescope at home and uh, Mark does in the observatory but I just don't um, so I never thought I'd better this and you know the processing of this wasn't the best the stars are a bit bloated but it was just it's always been a favorite image because it was taken on our mini honey moon we've had it printed on canvases it's on cushions it's everywhere and I honestly never thought that I'd better it but this year I decided I was cleaning up some hard drives and realized that I'd imaged the Pleiades pretty much exactly a year apart using exactly the same setup and the camera was aligned in a similar way so I actually stacked all of the images from both data sets so there's one lot of that was 19 lots of 90 seconds and the other was 70 lots of 120 seconds and I stacked all of that together and it's the first time I've successfully stacked images that were taken on different nights I generally just do an imaging run on a night and stick with the data from that night and I just love this picture the stars aren't as bloated I've managed to preserve some of the blue color better and there is just so much gas I mean obviously there is still noise even though I did shoot darks as well for some of this yeah, this camera is always going to suffer with some amount of graininess in the background, but this is another one I just really tried to not darken the background too much to hide that because this whole area is just full of gas and dust and it's a shame to process that out, I think. So yeah, I did add star spikes and yes, I know I probably shouldn't have done because it was done with a refractor, but I think this sort of star spike can actually really make the Pleiades look very artistic and very pretty. So yeah, I've now beaten it. I don't know whether I'll ever get a better version than this maybe I'll have a go but I will, it's another one I go back to every year I image it every year without fail now I love the Pleiades and I love Earthshine and I loved this comet so much it inspired my first tattoo so that is my shoulder it's not finished there's going to be more around the outside some nebula regions added but yeah I loved all of those objects so much that they had to be immortalized on my shoulder now, while we're talking about the Pleiades, you may remember that at the beginning of April, um, Venus moved so close to the Pleiades that it actually became part of the star cluster. And I've shown this wider field shot first, just to give you some perspective, because when you see the telescopic shot, it doesn't seem to have quite the same impact. But it only happens every eight years that Venus gets this close to the star cluster. And so this is above our weather station. But this was, we actually had a clear night for four nights around this event. And I took this picture. Now I had in my mind, I'd never photographed this type of conjunction before. And I had in my mind that I wanted to do an exposure where I was picking up some nebulosity on the Pleiades. Um, but actually Venus is so bright that it completely floods the pixels. You just can't do a long exposure. But what I decided to do instead is any of you that do photography will know what a Batonoff mask is. So you generally stick that on the front of the telescope to assist you with focusing. I absolutely love pictures of Venus taken with the Batonoff mask on because it gives you this lovely diffraction pattern as well as the blooming around the outside. So I took one photograph with the mask on, one with the mask off, and I really hated the way the Pleiades looked with diffraction spikes, but I liked Venus. So I blended the two together so that it's this is an actual composite of two different images. It's purely artistic and I know that it really split the crowd when I shared this on social media because like why would you take a picture with the Batonoff mask on? I did it purely because it looked artistic. It was just for artistic effect and this was just one of those events that I just thought needed to be captured in an artistic way. You know, I don't know how it hadn't been on my radar that this thing happens every eight years but I just 
wasn't aware of it. I also did shoot this on consecutive nights and aligned them so that you had Venus in different positions to show the movement on those different nights. But yeah, we were so, so lucky to actually have clear nights around that event. And it was a real special one that I'll never forget. Now the Orion, um, oh, sorry, the Horsehead Nebula, which is also in Orion, is another bucket list object. And this was another one that we imaged for the first time when we went to Astro Farm. And again, I was under the illusion that I would never be able to better that because of the sky conditions and the equipment. But actually we had a really good imaging night on the 15th of February. And this was from my back garden in Oxfordshire. Now it was imaged through a hydrogen alpha filter and with narrow band imaging, you don't suffer so much with problems that light pollution gives you because you're only looking at one wavelength, which is not the same as street lights. So this was um, 39 lots of 120 seconds, just ISO 1600. This was a modded Canon 1100D, which I have one of. And this whole area is just so rich in red colored gas and dust. And it's just so beautiful. And I love it. I just love the Horsehead Nebula. And it's another one that I go back to again and again. And yeah, I'm guilty of putting star spikes on this again. The reason I did that is because the scope was starting to due up and there are actually weird kind of cross-shaped diffraction spikes on some of the stars here so I just stuck those on because they really showed up on the brighter stars so you can actually use star spikes to disguise any kind of weirdness in your pictures but uh, the Orion Nebula the um, Horsehead Nebula and the Orion Nebula were just old favorites that every winter we just have to go back to again and again this picture was taken in August last year, and it's definitely a region that I want to image more of again this year. This is the, um, the part of the huge Veil Nebula complex. The other bit that's regularly photographed is the Witch's Broom, but this is um, a different part of it, and all of it is huge. And I'd quite like to kind of do a mosaic of the whole area because you can't fit all of it in the field of view with um, this camera and telescope set up. But a small refractor is perfect for this kind of thing. And processing this is a headache because it's a very dense star region and the stars tend to flood the nebula out a little bit. It was a bit of an uphill battle, but this is one of those times where I kind of felt a little bit like I'd taken a picture that was almost heading towards what Hubble might have done. It just having those two colors, it just gives the illusion of a bicolor narrowband image, even though it isn't. It's just taken with a modded camera. But yeah, beautiful part of the sky. Um, one that's with us for all the summer so definitely one I'll be returning to again There's, this was quite a long imaging run it was 73 lots of 90 seconds um, I never go above ISO 1600 now because it's just not worth it for the kind of noise level and depending on what the background sky conditions are like, my exposures vary from kind of 40 seconds up to two minutes, depending on whether the mount's behaving as well. But 90 seconds is a good safe middle ground. Then if the mount has a wobbly, then you're not losing loads of your data. So yeah, another part I'll definitely go back to again and a really pretty one. Um, I'm going to go through some pictures that I have processed myself that were taken with the Forks telescope. I went on a remote imaging workshop uh, last December before last with Pete Williamson and this telescope is a two meter well there's a series of two meter professional telescopes that weigh 25 tons each and they're fully um, remotely controlled and Pete gave me a whole bunch of data from his hard drive when I was on that course. And what's great about working with this data is it's all pre-calibrated. It's super high quality data because it's taken with a camera that probably costs more than most people's houses cost. And it's really good data to practice with. And if you're trying to get to grips with new processing software or anything like that, starting off with data that's very good, it, it's a really good way of learning the, the software. So I had a lot of fun doing this. Had to do the Horsehead Nebula, obviously. Um, this is such a zoomed in view and the amount of detail that you get in here with this little kite shaped feature and the sweeping, swooshing kind of gas that's coming off this what looks like a bow wave it's just so gorgeous and I actually like the monochrome version of this as well as the color one and I've done a sketch based on this photograph in monochrome which came out really well such a beautiful part of the sky and seeing it so close up like that is really special 
the Crab Nebula, it's um, one of those objects that like the Crab Nebula now would not have made it into Messier's catalogue if he was looking at it today, not just because of light pollution, but this is a constantly expanding supernova remnant. And it's a complete fluke that the Fawkes telescope is exactly the same focal length as the um, um, my mind's gone blank. The Hubble, that's my brain. The Hubble Space Telescope has exactly the same field of view and everything as the Fawkes Telescope does. So P actually made a GIF animation showing how this object has changed in 25 years. And it's changed a lot and its overall surface brightness is dimmed by a considerable amount. So this object is now not easily visible at all, naked eye. And it's one of those objects, it's a real challenge to photograph it because it's quite small, it's quite faint, and unless you've got a huge aperture telescope, it's very difficult. So actually being able to get all of this detail, this was RGB and H-alpha all combined, and this was the first time I'd ever combined a narrow band channel in with my color channels. So really good practice, and it's just such a gorgeous object to be able to photograph in this level of detail, something that I'm definitely never gonna be able to achieve from home, that's for sure, because I don't have a two meter telescope. And some of the galaxy stuff that I've processed with this telescope as well, it's just mind blowing that we can get pictures like this from Earth. So there's Whirlpool Galaxy and this kind of one that's on its side here, NGC 7331, just such beautiful objects. And there's loads of other satellite galaxies here as well. Just lovely. And it's a joy to process this kind of image. You know, if, digital photography has just completely revolutionized astronomy can you imagine the likes of charles messier actually seeing these objects in detail like this i'd love for them to be able to come back and actually look at what we're seeing now because charles messier when he designed his catalog he wasn't remotely interested in the objects as objects all he was doing was saying this is not a comet so ignore it and i think yeah, visual astronomy can be a little bit underwhelming from that point of view. But if those guys that were responsible for these old catalogues could see these objects the way we see them now, I'm sure they would think very differently about them. Uh, so, so beautiful. Um, final section I'm going to talk about is weather and clouds. Now, I know as astronomers, I'm not supposed to like clouds and um, not supposed to like extreme weather, but I actually love photographing weather phenomenon as well as um, astronomy stuff. And some clouds are very, very interesting. Something I have been after for years is iridescence in aircraft vapor trails now aircraft vapor trails are just water when i shared this picture online you will not believe the amount of chemtrail stuff i got thrown at me it was just insane but we all know from looking at rainbows that water droplets and sunlight can create lots of different spectral effects you get a dispersion splitting the colors and you get it as well with um, low level cloud where water droplets form these circular corona around the sun or the moon and it's all just because it's water droplets and this is very different from the stuff you get with ice crystals but this colorful um, vapor trail is something I've I knew existed I'd never seen it visually until last year when I was taking a picture with my wide angle lens and I noticed an aircraft fly through the field of view that had rainbow vapor trails and that camera just didn't pick it up because you couldn't zoom in on it with that lens so this was the first time I'd managed to capture this and this plane was showing color the entire length of its transit across the sky and what's also cool as well is you can see a shadow here from the wing being cast on to the clouds too so I was so excited when I got this picture I actually took loads of pictures of this and you know there are many of them on my social media but just such a cool shot and yeah I was really really happy to have got that Oh, this is another one as well where you can see even more of the kind of shadow effects coming off the tail and from the wing so yeah very 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 beautiful and once you know these things exist you'd be surprised how often they're actually visible you just need to know when and where to look now crepuscular rays are something that i've loved for years and they're called crepuscular from the latin meaning twilight i believe and that's because they're more often noticed when the sun is low down but actually any time you have the clouds and the sun it, these are basically just shadows of this broken cloud and um, being cast onto the the sky beyond and 
they're just beautiful. I, of all the things that have nearly made me crash my car the most, it's been crepuscular rays because obviously when you're driving, you can't take a picture of them. So I tend to be glancing out of the window and thinking, oh, those crepusculars look awesome. And then realize you're nearly going to drive into a hedge. So definitely not recommended. But because we get a lot of clouds, you get crepuscular rays pretty much daily if there's clouds around. So there's always something to see. But one of the things that isn't quite as well-known are anti-crepuscular rays. And those crepuscular rays basically can travel all the way across the sky. Now, if you look at this picture that I just showed you, they appear to converge at the sun. But anti-crepuscular rays converge again at the anti-solar point, which is a point directly opposite in the sky um, from the sun. And what really blows my mind is the crepuscular rays look like they're fanning out from the anti-solar point and they look like they're fanning out from the sun on the opposite side of the sky but in reality those rays are parallel beams of light and they're parallel but the distances involved are so huge that they appear to converge at the two points and it's the same if you stood on a straight patch of railway line or a road it looks like it gets narrower in the distance even though you know in your head that it can't do otherwise a train wouldn't be able to drive down it and it's exactly the same thing here and I've actually got a photograph um, that I show in my atmospheric optics talk where one of the Apollo spacecraft um, astronauts took a photograph showing crepuscular rays from space and they are straight lines and it, it really makes my brain hurt very often you will see anti-crepuscular rays in association with a rainbow and then it looks like spokes of a wheel and it's called a wheel. Um, but this particular rainbow fragment with these really bright rays, this was kind of like some of the brightest anti-crepuscular rays I'd ever seen. And it's one of those things because your eye is drawn to where the sun is, a lot of times people don't notice that anti-crepuscular rays even exist. And quite often if you get them in association with a rainbow, people think it's just rain that you're seeing, the rainfall pattern in the clouds so definitely something to look out for if it's something you wasn't aware of now on our way back from Barcelona in 2016 we were sat on the non-sun side of the aircraft and I noticed this full set of circular anti-crepuscular rays and in the next picture you can actually see the anti-solar point so these rays are emerging from a blank spot against the sky which just makes my brain hurt but it's just proof that these things are parallel because they're not emitting from anything they're just appearing to converge on them and I was so excited on this aircraft journey my, my, I was just clung to the window I took hundreds of pictures with my phone just absolutely extraordinary and hardly anybody else on the aircraft had even noticed it was there so yeah weather phenomenon always awesome and cloud bursts you quite often get those in association with rainbows as well and this was a particularly spectacular one that was very very wet as evidenced when I got rained on shortly after this was taken um, but I'm, I'm fine with that I love getting wet it's not a problem uh, this particular picture this I, some of you guys may remember this in August 2018 these are um, horizontal convective roll clouds and these clouds this is another thing that tricks your brain slightly if you've got a really good clear view of the horizon and you can see clouds low down to the horizon the chances are those clouds are actually hundreds of miles away you're just seeing them low down to the horizon and that was the same with these these i think they sometimes call them cloud streets and there's a satellite photograph that was taken the morning after and that was launched um, online the morning after and you can see that these lines of cloud were actually hundreds of miles long they covered almost half of the uk but they just look like they were just very strange. Whichever direction you looked in, you could just see these huge long convective roll clouds and you don't get them very often from the UK. You certainly get one or two, but to get whole layers of them like this, it's quite unusual. And the, the weather patterns we have in this country just doesn't normally lend itself to forming these. So this is one of those situations where because I, I'm in a chronic insomniac and even if it's cloudy, I tend to stick my head out the door at silly o'clock. I was out here at kind of midnight, one o'clock in the morning taking pictures of these when most sensible people were actually in bed asleep and because of that these pictures ended up being used widely in the national press so the, these pictures are the ones that have been the most successful in terms of media stuff I mean I've had pictures shown on tv and in local newspaper quite a lot and and I don't put my pictures online for that that's not why I do this but it's nice if you do get 
that happen. But these pictures went crazy and they were shown in so many different national newspapers. And so it, that was really pretty cool and um, just for some cruddy cloud pictures really so it's a shame that I was not kind of most of the pictures I've been seeing were clouds and that's something we generally try to avoid as astronomers this sort of cloud however I never avoid these are noctilucent clouds we've had some incredible displays already this season but this was from a couple of um, summers ago and it's really difficult to pick a favourite because I just adore noctilucent clouds and I'm out there most nights and very sleep deprived. Um, so yeah, these um, clouds are just extraordinary. And this particular event here was the remnants of a noctilucent cloud tornado. Now I live in hope of one day capturing a real tornado, but for the time being, I have to settle for a noctilucent cloud tornado instead. But they are just such beautiful clouds. They're so ethereal and just, it's the only time of the year that I'm willing to set an alarm for 2 a.m. The rest of the time, that's just never going to happen. So, yeah, not to lose it. Clouds, so beautiful. Make sure you keep an eye open for them after sunset and before sunrise in the next month or so. <coughs> now, lightning. I absolutely love photographing lightning. Um, my husband's nickname for me is Lightning McSpice. Um, I was Spicer before I married my husband and became McIntyre. And I've just loved capturing lightning photographs now this is my spine i love showing my x-ray picture i have titanium screws and rods in my lumbar spine and i have a spinal cord stimulator so this is underneath the skin it's a control unit and a battery the wires go up to an electrode bank in, that's connected to my spinal cord and if this gets turned off i struggle to walk and i'm in a wheelchair every time i leave the house when it's turned on it relieves the symptoms I have and it means I can walk so I spent nearly 10 years in a wheelchair I had surgery to put this thing in and now I can walk again so it's awesome that's why I'm very proud of these x-ray pictures because it's changed my life having this surgery but whether having this inside my body with titanium rods in my spine increases my chance of being struck by lightning or decreases it I really don't know um, I do take a lot of care to make sure I keep myself safe when I do this but when you get pictures like this it's just awesome this was another picture this was the first time I had a picture published in a magazine and um, Canon EOS magazine actually showed this picture in their magazine back in 2014 I really wish that my camera had been focused better but this is one of my first proper attempts at imaging lightning with my SLR and it's very hard to guess where the focus is when you have nothing to focus on and the sky is pitch black unless there's a lightning bolt. Um, but this was a very nearby and a really impressive lightning bolt. It was really quite something. Last, no, two years ago, 2018, we actually had two different occasions where we had the most extraordinary storms. And um, as part of the time lapses and the pictures I took on that this night, this picture was taken, I saw some incredible cloud formations, exactly the sort of cloud formations that would normally produce a tornado. Sadly, I didn't get a tornado. I thought I had, but it was just a heavy patch of rain. <coughs> but this, um, this storm was actually 40 miles away and it was skirting around to the west of us as they always do. They never actually come over where I live, but that's good. It's actually safer to photograph lightning from a distance. But as this moved closer, there was a wall, all this you can just sort of make out here was a wall of water, essentially. Once that hit, I was drenched through to the skin, but I got some incredible lightning shots that night. And this is one of my favorites because just having that one fork lightning in amongst an otherwise empty landscape kind of feels really cool. This particular shot was taken from the same field, but looking in a slightly different direction. This is looking towards Banbury, which is where the storm was. This is a single shot. Um, both of these lightning bolts happened at the same time. And again, an absolutely awesome shot. This is a seven image stack. Um, one of the things I try to do when I'm photographing lightning is just shoot on continuous with my camera pointing the same way. Then every time I get a lightning bolt, I save the picture and then I stack them all together to see what they look like. Sometimes it can look a bit of a dog's dinner because 
obviously there's no point stacking the ones that don't have lightning in so the clouds end up looking a bit odd like you can see here there's like the rain falling from different sections as the clouds have moved throughout the imaging run but just stacking all that lightning together just makes for a really impressive photo and it's one of these things when I do this I'm always extremely clear when I share the images that that's what I've done it really annoys me when photographers try to pass off a lightning shot as being a single shot when it's a stack um that it's just not correct to do that you need to be very clear that that's what you've done but I, I just use star stacks to do this because it's a lot easier than trying to do it in photoshop and star stacks is great you drag and drop the images press stack and it does it and then you save the image and that's all you need to do you don't need to do anything fancy and you get some really nice shots and this is a six image stack as well this was actually a storm over Northampton. I was watching it on the lightning map while I was in the field with my other camera photographing Noctilucent clouds and this there was a kind of lightning bolt that went down this exact path four times out of these six images so I don't know whether there was a, a lightning rod there or something but something was attracting the lightning because it shot in exactly the same place each time and well it probably wasn't it just looked like it from where I was viewing it so these pictures are cropped but yep, a long way, Northampton is a long way from Oxford, but it just shows you that you can do lightning photography from quite a distance. Generally now, if there's um, lightning going on, I will keep an eye on the lightning maps and just drive to a vantage point. So I kind of do some mini storm chasing activities. Now, finally, I mentioned to some of the people at the beginning that I like to play around with microscopes and do macro photography as well as astrophotography, as well as nature and wildlife photography. And one of the things that I started to try and do in 2018 and in late 2017 was to capture photographs of individual snowflakes. Now, we don't get snow that often, so I've still not quite perfected this technique, but we had a late um, kind of spring snowstorm uh, in March 2018. So this was just using my fixed 50 mil lens and I used extension tubes so I could get focused a lot nearer because otherwise you have to keep quite far back from the object. So having the extension tubes gets your lens much, much nearer the object. I had a piece of black felt that was out on a table that had been out all day so it was nice and cold. So that way when the snowflakes land on it, they don't melt. Although if this did hang around long enough to get a picture, it is starting to melt, as you can see around the outside edges, because in March, it's never cold enough for snowflakes to survive very long. But this is the best snowflake picture I've taken to date. I have taken others as well, but this is definitely my favourite. And this has been a, a lovely photo Christmas card for a couple of years. I've dined out on this picture quite extensively. So... Um, yeah, I really, really enjoy um, doing snowflake photography. Next on my list is to preserve them in cold superglue because then you can fossilize the, the pattern. And the way you do that is to have superglue in the freezer, but not so cold that it isn't liquid anymore. You have microscope slides in the freezer and then you take them outside. And when a snowflake lands on your microscope slide, you put the very cold glue over the top of it put a cover slip on it and put it straight into the freezer <laughs> and that way when it freezes you then end up um when you take it out obviously the ice will melt but it will leave a fossilized imprint of that snowflake and that is definitely something i have not perfected very well yet every time i did it i killed the snowflake but because no two are ever the same that would be a unique object once it's fossilized so yeah we didn't get any snow this year that was I was able to do this with so definitely something I'll try again in the future. Um, this was another couple of snowflakes that had landed quite near each other as well and I really love the six-sided flat plates that you can get as well as the kind of spiky bits but definitely no two snowflakes I've taken pictures of have ever been remotely similar. So thank you very much everybody for listening. I hope that was useful for you. I will um, stop the share now and I'm going to have a look at the chat and see if there are any um, chat questions. So let me just um, turn the hosting back to uh, Alan. Make host. There we go. Okay, Alan is now the host again. So okay. let me just quickly have a look at the chat. I did ask everybody. Okay. 
yeah, oh, that's fine. To the end. So start asking your questions now. <laughs> Don't to un unmute yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will help. Either type them in or, um, you know, chime in. So I think I'm losing the light slightly. I'm just going to open this curtain. While everyone is sort of trying to overcome their shyness, um, going back to the image of the solar eclipse um, that you took, uh, there seemed to be a star in the background at about eight o'clock. Was it a star or a planet? It was. It was Regulus. <laughs> it, was, it was so strange seeing a star at midday. It was just insane. Yeah. So I kept that in because, yeah, to be able to see a bright star like that, it was quite something else. It was an amazing photo amazing i can't believe i still literally can't believe i took that because honestly if you'd seen the state i was in when it happened i looked up and saw that corona and i i just it was proper soap opera exaggerated crying i was just a mess and it was just so beautiful and i just couldn't stop crying and i think we put so much planning into that trip we'd been working for three years practicing the photography practice just my husband put more work into it than me but we'd put so much into it and we didn't know whether we'd get to the state park we didn't know whether we'd get caught in traffic we didn't know whether it'd be cloudy there were so many things that could have gone wrong and in the end it was a perfect day and the point where we drove from denver there's a moment where we crossed the line um, into the path of totality and we knew at that point that even if the wheels fell off the car we were going to see this it might only be for a few seconds but we knew we were going to see it and we just looked at each other and we both got goosebumps and we're like we're doing it we're actually going to do this and when I do my eclipse talk I struggle not to actually choke up at that point when we reach the the, the bit where we knew we were going to definitely get within the totality path it was so special it really was it is a, a wonderful moment, isn't it? That those of us who are a little bit older and can remember the 1999 solar eclipse that we could see from the UK. Um, uh, we went down to a hotel in Torquay. Now, if those of you watching can remember, it was a, an abysmal day. It was quite cloudy. But I can assure you, at Torquay, at the appropriate time, the sky cleared and it was a, an awe-inspiring moment. Um, seafront lights came on, seagulls landed on the sea. Um, it, it was brilliant. Um, just one of those wonderful experiences. The hotel, yeah. the hotel was more like 40 Towers, um, but <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it wasn't. Somebody else yes. has got a question. Um, Mary, I have a quick question. Um, yep. Your ISS transit pictures, um, in two days' time, seven o'clock in the morning um my app says that i have a solar transit of the iss mm -hmm. how how can you extract a single frame uh, i mean uh, i understand obviously you're um you're stacking a particular section mm -hmm. um, i mean the, the the transit is only like a second long yeah if that <laughs> yeah so you start you start your video sort of presumably 30 seconds before and you finish it I do it more because sometimes the app can be out. So I always err on the side of caution and start yeah, quite early. <laughs> okay. So, so when you finish stacking, you're going to have your line of, of um, ISS uh, images across the sun. Okay. Yeah. Can, so, can, sorry, was you going to say, how do I get them out? Well, I, I was wondering whether you edit it first. So you only stack the particular part of the video, which has only got the ISS transit in. I do. Uh, Right. I use so, PIP, so a free piece of software called PIP, P-I-P-P. -P. It's actually a planetary pre-processing tool. And what you can do with that is load an AVI into it and extract all the still frames. So, because every camera that creates a video is actually taking still frames and turning it into a video. So it's very okay. easy for software to reverse that process. So PIP okay. gives you all the individual ones. So you'll have this video that probably has 4,000 frames or 2,000 frames. The yeah. ISS will be in 10 of them probably if yeah. you're lucky. Yeah. And so I take those 10 out and process 
the still frames and then I stack them in star stacks because I find it's the easiest tool for doing that kind of stacking and that that's how I do it and sometimes if you've got a super high frame rate you might want to emit every other one but generally not and I will also kind of crop the video extensively so you don't have those huge long bits before or after and sometimes I just recreate a time lapse only with the frames that have the ISS in as well but the only thing to look out for with PIP is when you debayer it sometimes it can get your Bayer matrix wrong so the first time I did this the video of it I put up was bright blue because I didn't realize I didn't know how to correct it but I do know that now but yeah it's dead easy to do in PIP it's um I'll I'll message you the instructions on how to because it's super super simple pips great i love it for that and can you add, extract a single frame so if, if there's one particular yeah. frame where you have what's a you know quite a nice sharp iss can you extract that one on its own and perhaps enlarge it somehow um yeah you can just take one of the the one that has it in um because yeah. you i it's not a fast enough frame rate to actually stack to get detail on the iss it's moving too quickly and obviously mm. you've got the sun in the way or the moon in the way so yeah it, it will give you all those individual frames and there really won't be many of them that have it in but then you can yeah. just choose your favorite one to crop and increase the resolution of um i use focus magic to increase resolution i find it works really well you can increase times four and it will still look good so have you, have you ever used a topaz suites i haven't i've heard good things about it, it does fantastic. similar things yeah, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. I can recommend it. Yeah, I need to look at it. Uh, it's on my list of things to try. I, I, I bought Affinity last week, which I need to learn how to use as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? My goodness. You you've, you, you've, you've gained the cat there, I see, <laughs> as well. Uh, oh, yes. I just, could I just put, could I just put in and say um, thank you for the suggestion on reloading. It, I did it several times and eventually it worked and I'm using my ear, ear pieces, oh, thin pieces to, to cut the blades. It's excellent, excellent tool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sure that all of us would like, love to say thank you ever so much for a terrific talk there. <laughs> yep. Thank <Thousands> you. Applauses. <laughs> Certainly, um, the emphasis uh, that it didn't have to be connected through a telescope, I think, will inspire people that they can take their cameras out and get checking away. And if we could take photos anywhere near as good as those ones that you've done, I think we would all feel very, very proud of ourselves. So um, on behalf of the Hartford Astronomy Group, a very big thank you to you. Uh, also for the PDF files, which you sent down to us, which we... Uh, change monthly on the website um, with tips about how to improve photography. Uh, we'll say thank you for that and also for the permission to publish tonight's talk on YouTube. 